I next to my speakers, Dean Lori Benaka from NTC and Harvard, uh, take the word. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present today. I'm going to give a talk with a rather uh, ambitious title with the physics of intelligence for Worthian Green AI. In particular, uh, given this amazing theme of the uh, conference, I want to focus on doing neural learning and computation as physical dynamics so that we can expect some general insights that can be transferred for, for device design and hardware. So the type of research that I do is where I treat AI systems, learning models, as a subject of study. And then I take approach from physics, like how we study you know, natural science, systems like biology or soft matter or superconductor using you know, approach from physics, I study AI as a subject. And let me first begin by sharing why I think this is a new frontier in physics. So if you look back the history of the interaction between technology and science, there is a recursing trend. So people often quote how imaging led to the normalization of the thermodynamics of the theory. And if you look back the history, 1712 was the first commercially successful steam engine. Um, and then after a century, industrial revolution happened with a hot steam engine, which was like a chat GPT moment, for example, for the uh, world of steam engine industry. Then it took another half century until Sabi Kaono, who was a military engineer, who was trying to better understand the robot, make it like more robust and efficient, and which has led to the uh, basic laws of thermodynamics as we know. And But then physics doesn't just stop here. Uh, once we extract those principles, we can then apply those principles to do better engineering. The first engine didn't stop at the steam engine. Thermodynamics has let the foundation for building the next generation of engine. And in, in the last century, we have seen amazing expansion of condensed matter physics where you know, design of the transistor, semiconductor, was really coupled with the development of how we understand many body quantum systems. And then uh, for, uh, after it, there was also a chemical engineering revolution where we asked the question of, okay, how do we liquid crystal polymer behave? And then there was a accompanying scientific domain, physics domain of matter physics or even like biological physics, you know, right now. And if we continue this trend, I bet is that the, what's happening, the most important technological revolution happening right now is AI. And also as my colleague Farty has shared yesterday, there's another revolution in neuroscience. So we have many reason to believe that, that we have much higher resolution of data and then amazing interesting behavior coming out both from the brain and the AI. And that I wanna share my efforts to in particular understand using deep learning using thoughts from physics. And one important observation here is that uh, as deep learning is becoming more and more a uh, bigger and bigger part I'm within computer science, I believe that the method that we use to understand computer have to shift from traditional computer science way, natural science way. So in the previous conventional part I'm with the phenomenal computing, the computer was supposed to precisely execute human defined algorithm. If you have a task that you want a computer to perform, write down some algorithm, implement them with programming, and error correct the computer, execute them really precisely. And because of that, the field of theoretical computer science has been almost like mathematics. You have an algorithm that you personally understand, and then the study of it has been mathematical proofs about how they, what they behave in terms of convergence or error, et cetera. The paradigm of deep learning, uh, or more broadly, the natural computing that many of the people here subscribe to, is something, you know, the traditional way. So what we are trying to do is that we are trying to engineer with emergent abilities, emergent phenomena that we see in neural networks or any other computing physical devices. So in particular, uh, last year, uh, you know, there was this huge polarization of the ChatGPT and large language models. And then how that came about was that, uh, okay, so you have these uh, large neural networks is trying to always predict the next word in this long sentence. That was a training objective. It was, it, it was a simple one. But then as we scale up the size of the data, size of the model and size of the compute, which is a training time, then suddenly after some scale size of the system and the network that's only trained to do the next word, I become able to do some mathematical operation, solving math word problems, or you know, even having some like a logical, uh, um, something that resembles a logical reasoning. There is a debate about it. 
And then I have within just a year, people are actually using it in society in many. And then I see that us, many of you here also have tried it for you. But then there are also accompanying challenges. But those challenges can be well, these computers are not human programs, so we never know what kind of kind of decision that these computers make and then how they make. So nothing is a transparent, and then the chat GPT is like a huge black box, just like our brain is. So what I would argue is that uh, we should approach the problem of better understanding and making the large neural network more robust and efficient. We, we should take the science approach. In physics, as many of the people have also been talking about, there's a long tradition of, let's say, studying superconductivity. It was a capability of materials to conduct electron with like no resistivity, and then it was first found by Karin Onest, you know. But then it took almost again half century until the BCA theory, which is a microscopic theory, explain right. the phenomena to come about. But then after this interaction between science and engineering, this is now a foundational technology that's gonna, you know, for the next generation of bullet train in Japan. So the concluding statement for this motivational slide is that the modern AI is a complex system itself with a wealth of emergent phenomena and whose understanding can lead to immediate practical impact. So this is a elevable goal. And with this goal, it been, our group has at NDT Research at Harvard has been tackling all the ingredients of the learning system. So any deep learning system or the learning system has uh, at least four ingredients, which is a architecture. So when you say deep learning, you're talking about multiple layers, which is a you know, mathematical operations of architecture. And then there's a question of, okay, how do the choice of certain architecture affect the outcome of the training? There is also physics of learning optimization. So optimization is a, a curative update of papameter. Again, not much has been understood, and then there are a lot of science to be done. There's also a, a physics of loss landscape. So when you adapt the training, there is a corresponding loss function or objective function. Then that has certain set of symmetries depending on the class of problem that you're trying to tackle. And we were, for example, applying uh, you know, Landau theory, which says, okay, if you have some symmetry on the loss landscape, that's going to constrain the training dynamics in a certain way. And the first half that I just talked about was much more theoretical works, but then I also believe that the experimental physics of AI is what's really needed right now, because if you look at the chat GPT, the uh, phenomena that we see itself is not really mathematically defined. People, start, people are starting to talk about like what is logical reasoning or what is imagination coming out of generative models, but these are, again, loosely defined terms. What we do most recently our group is to construct our own data set, train our own models so that we can mathematically define what we are talking about, and then first empirically characterize the behavior of these generative models. And then they have application for you know making them more safer with fine tuning. Or another thing that I want to just mention is that the, uh, we are starting a lot of collaboration with psychologists because psychologists again has been thinking about how human cognition works. But then that has been a bit far away from physics because the human brain. There's so much, uh, you can't really take quantitative numbers, right? We can't really record from human brains There's so many neurons or synaptic weights, but uh, using generative AI as a quantitative experimental platform, uh, we have a third medium that physicists can now talk with psychologists to better understand what these neural networks are doing at a behavior level. And then I'm gonna quickly just mention this part because Farty already gave a nice overview, but we also work on applying AI for better understanding the actual brain. So today, I want to quickly go through uh, two types of problems that we are recently worked on. The first one is, the question was, in generative AI, in particular diffusion models, so this it has like nice connection to a physical process, imagine. And this is one of the recent work that we're trying to connect all the concepts from cognitive science using its to AI as a critical platform, and then do some physics about it. The second half, uh, we want to view learning and optimization and physical dynamics. And we're going to der derive general Lagrangian comprising the dynamics of the training, and then see how that interacts with the symmetry, even practical. Like, let me start with the first one. Generative AI can generate stun stunning graphics. Probably people have already tried it uh, yourselves, but if you, for example, prompt Tickets saying an astronaut riding a horse in space into GPT-4, uh, open AI model, you get this stunning image as an output. 
And then people have been saying, you know, maybe these large model has just remembered what's already there, out there in the internet and then they're just doing some search and then copying it. But to do a bit of intervention about the possibility, I also put a panda skin with an iguana holding hands in Aspen, which is pretty good, right? I don't think there is any, there might be, but I, I don't think it's a common image to be there on the internet, but then still a concept of panda and iguana are composed together and then they're holding hands this model also nicely adjusted the size, the size between panda and iguana, where iguana is like small, but then it's still visible, it has like really all nice ingredients. The question is, what is the algorithm behind the gener generation of the stunning image? Again, the point is that the, there is no human written algorithm to generate such image. You're just coming out of all the large nonlinear complexity. I've got to learn it. And, but then this has like really nice connection to the theme of the conference because the algorithm under the food that's running to generate this system as originally developed by, you know, like my postdoc advisors groups, as three as the Gulli's group, where they took inspiration from non equilibrium thermodynamics. And then the way these machines generate images is that the you first in the training time take some uh basically a standard image from the training set and then you iteratively add white noise. Right. But you first sequentially crop the image, but then you use neural network to reverse the process. So these neural networks are used to denoise the image to do the reverse time diffusion. And then if you do, if you then update all the parameters of all these neural networks so that you can perform this denoising task, then if we give new input to the network, they are able to output stunning image. This is a helpful idea. However, since this diffusion model, as you can see, not too close to how human brain works, they are successful in many cases, but then they also fail in unexpected ways. One example is composition of uh, species and color. Here, first I asked the model to generate lizard with four different colors, successful. Next, it's a goldfish with four different colors, again, successful. Then if we ask the model to generate panda with four different colors, and suddenly the panda and the color concept will be composed well. I mean, the magenta is doing quite okay, but then white, green, blue are just plain panda. So this composition didn't happen. So the statement that I'm trying to make here is that the, this composition of concepts is uh, something fundamental to our human brain's uh, ability, but then AI models picking up these things is non-trivial. So to take physicists approach to this problem, are we the question that we asked is that the, what is the simplest system, simplest deep learning system that captures the essence of composition of generalization? Well, we can still probe like what's happening inside. Here's a training set that we have crafted. We have the set of simple text information and corresponding image. And then the task is to predict what the, to fill in the question mark in the image. So this is a task that the diffusion model is trained to do. You identify the pattern, and then probably you have guessed that it's a blue triangle, which is correct. The way we human brain do that, do it is to contrast the image and text, and then say, okay, one is circle, two is triangle, A is red, B is blue. These are the uh, attractions of the tasks that generative models are trying to solve. And then we introduce this uh, concept graph framework where we define set of uh, variables. So first we have shape, color, size, location, angle as variables. And then each variable has to be filled in with values, just circle, shape, small size, etc. And then once we specify these ingredients, then we have concept class, which has corresponding family of image. So in this case, circle, small, blue are specified. So the positions are random, but then there is a set of images that corresponds to the concept class. And then we can create a graph. So it's a, if you are familiar with a humming graph in coding theory, this is basically a way to arrange binary bit. Where but the motivation here was to define a distance measure. Okay, so when diffusion model has seeing, let's say, these uh, one, two, three, four uh, clearly drawn objects in a training set, and then trying to generate what's in the question mark in the graph. Now, this graphical framework allows to quantify how difficult is it for the diffusion model to generate certain Im image based on the humming distance from the training set to the generalization point. And then with this setup, uh, we train actually train Diffusion models with GPUs, and then uh, if people are, you know, if there are people 
we're saying, oh, these are just circle triangles. You do the same thing with human faces later, so don't worry, worry about it. Uh, everything can be you know, translated to more realistic value. And the question that we asked is that the kind of diffusion model will generalize the concept class was never seen before. Training data said, and then if so, in what order? Is there any specific order of generalization that happens dictated uh, by the structure of the training set? And here's what we see. So in the beginning, the diffusion model just generates noise. But then as it learns, it slowly learns to pick up like a better and better geometries. But then, for example, it's still like the colors are globally red or blue. But it's not capturing the color concept yet. Everything is still jiggling. But then if we wait for long enough, the first statement is that the diffusion model indeed can solve the task of this compositional generalization. And then if you more quantitatively look at what's happening in, in the system, and diffusion model first remembers what's already in the training set. So it's really quick for them to learn how to draw the geometric objects in a training data set. And then confirming our hypothesis, what happens next is that they generalize to this distance one location. And then generating this little blue triangle, you need to learn all the concepts of shape and color and size and color to do this. So it, this generalization happens at the very end. And then if you look at the curve, it looks like there is some transition. In the, the first the red curve, it was almost nothing was happening. But then there is a certain time where uh, the capability to draw this uh, little blue triangle has been picked up. And then this is actually what people see everywhere in modern deep learning, where you scale up, the, let's say, the time of training or size of the model. People call it emerging capabilities, where nothing happens. For example, this language model, nothing like ChatGPT happened for smaller models. But then as you keep making bigger and bigger, there's certain size where you know, this model suddenly becomes able to solve the math word problems or you know, all these kind of interesting tasks. And then the next step was to ask, OK, what is the mechanism behind these emergent abilities? And then we have really simple answer based on this our construction, which is to say that, OK, so when the task that the model is required to do is compositional, in this case, the model needs to learn about shape, size, color independently. And the model picks up these individual atomic capabilities one by one, then the model is only able to do these compositional tasks when all these capabilities are learned simultaneously under AND condition. And then to make it like a toy model about it, so we'll consider, let's say, ability to draw shape, size, color. So there are these list of atomic capabilities. And then assume that, the, OK, so these capabilities are learned almost like a flipping, right? So you flip a coin. There's a little probability of getting ahead. You flip it for many time steps, and then suddenly you pick up one capability. And then you do it for n capabilities. And you ask, ask that, that, OK, so task is compositional. So learning just, not just one, but then learning multiple concepts simultaneously is what you need to do. And what you see in the learning curve as a result is that the, the number of composition of the task increases from n equal 1 to n equal 20. The transition of the learning curve becomes sharper and sharper, which really resembles and explains what's happening both in our own experiments and then also what people see in this large-scale language model emergence curve. Again, the claim is that the compositionality is under this emergent phenomena in large-scale language models. This was the main point, but we also have uh, many other in engineering implications. What, the one was about, OK, so compositional generalization to minority class when data has some bias. So you care about generating not just majority images, but also minority images. You have to, for example, train the model 10 or 100 times longer to do it. And then we have uh, confirmation with much more realistic human facial data set about this same phenomena. And then this concludes this part. But then coming back to the high-level research program, uh, many of the projects that's running in our group right now sits at the interface between physics and then cognitive science or psychology. And other projects, for example, are, okay, so what do we even mean by logical reasoning? We model the logical reasoning as a navigating the graph where each step of the logic, and then there is operation to the logic, and then you make a, a logical steps. And then we are training little transformer to this, this navigation task to better understand how logical reasoning can be improved. And then also we are trying to do positional generalization study language models, where uh, instead of having these natural language tasks, we are 
synthetically creating mathematical transformation and asking the model to compose them to have much more rounded analysis of the phenomena that we see. Overall, as uh, this part of the talk was to say that, okay, it's, the field is really messy. We don't have any clear definition of what's happening in ChatGPT. But then, you know, I really want to end this part with a quote by Steven Weinberg, where, you know, he made a point saying when he jumped into particle physics, that was because everything looked like a mess. And our accelerator was creating elementary particles, like hundreds of them. But then that's almost like the state of the AI. But then a lot of has to clear up the physics. I don't know how much time there is remaining, but then I also want to uh, give you another flavor, another kind of work that we can do with AI, which is about tra treating learning as physical dynamics. So another issue that people in practical deep learning world face these days is this uh, challenge of learning big, big models. So these models have billions of parameters, and then you have to update these billions of parameters many, many times to train these models successfully. Then, of, as you can imagine, this is really you know, daunting process in the sense that, okay, so when you design your network, you have hundreds of architecture choices, right? Like how many what is the activation function that you want to use? What is the normalization that you, layer that you want to use? How many layers do you want to use? You have to decide to design the system. And then okay, you want to update these parameters. Then again, there are hundreds of choices. You what you want to use gradient descent or other more fancy optimization method? What, what should be the learning step? What should be the momentum? There's just so many engineering little details you have to think about. And there is no science about it. So uh, there are many papers coming out big issue of saying, OK, well, the type of problem that they care is, for example, on the top, uh, x-axis is a learning rate, so the update size, the parameter updates. Y-axis is the final quality of the model that you get. And then the lower, the be better quality in this plot. What you see is that, OK, if you increase a learning rate, well, the model, the loss decreases, meaning that the model gets better. But then if you, <laughs> there are these thresholds, random threshold almost, where if the learning rate goes above a certain point, then suddenly the training it just literally ex explodes. These are the exploding curve that you see in the plot. Yeah. And then people are just scratching their heads about it. And on the, the below, if you look at the red curve, which is, again, standard training uh, curve, you train it for many, many steps, like 3,000 steps, then this point, People are using a lot of uh, resources to do it, but then again, training blows up. So given the time constraint, I'm, I'm going to just end by uh, giving the high-level problem statement. Then uh, there is this uh, opportunity for research, better understand how these parameter moves uh, during the process of training. And then the type of work that we have been doing is to make an analogy between how, let's say, particle moves in classical mechanics and then how parameter moves in the parameter space in deep learning. And then we have been doing this one-by-one uh, uh, one analogy for force corresponds to the, all the gradient that the model gets. And then the mo there is the equation of motion corresponds to optimization method. There are symmetries of the architecture, which gives rise to symmetry of the loss function. And then what we have derived was actually generalized version of the NEFA theorem. So if we study these learning systems, there are interesting symmetry that are unique to deep learning systems. And then we can make connection to NEFA theorem, but generalize it for uh, doing something uh, practical. Then in deep learning system, there are many symmetries in the architecture. For example, the softmath function has this translation symmetry. There's a loss function with rotation symmetry. The normalization layer has a scale symmetry. So deep learning architecture, this brings symmetry to the loss function. And then uh, I'm going to go to the next slide. But there is a corresponding framework we can do for the optimization method. So if you look at gradient descent and then take a little infinitesimal learning rate limit, the typical lim limit that people study is a gradient flow. But then what's really important is that in deep learning practice, as you have seen, people always use finite learning rate and a step size. If you take that into account, what we have found was that the training dynamics is gradient descent with finite learning rate actually be described as a phase space dynamics with momentum. What that means is that there is corresponding Lagrangian function that we can write down. So it's a, there is a this is optimization theorem. So there is a dissipative term. But then we can write down really general you know, Lagrangian function that uh, encapsulates what's happening in the modern deep learning system. Okay. So at the high level, so the learning group gives kinetic energy. Plus landscape gives potential energy. And then we can study the interaction between them. So the physics textbook, the translation symmetry gives you 
relates to uh, more linear momentum. So that's true in deep learning as well. So this is like what we used to do in physics. And then another lesson is that, that translating a parameter does not change the dynamics of the potential energy. The same goes for rotation. So if you rotate the parameter vector for uh, under rotational symmetric function, nothing changes, right? Nothing changes in the training dynamics. But then what, what we have found is that the most important and the most common symmetry in deep learning is a scale symmetry where we say that, okay, you can multiply the weight vector of the deep network by some scalar, but that is not going to change the output because there is something happening called normalization of activation. And then this is a type of symmetry that I've never seen in physics, at least in my you know physics days. And then what this says is that, okay, scale symmetry uh, is present in the loss function, but then if you look at the kinetic energy, which is a velocity squared, multiplying the position vector by some scalar is not invariant, right? So the kinetic energy breaks the symmetry of the potential energy. There is this uh, really unique uh, symmetry breaking mechanism, uh, which is I've never seen in physics, but then it's everywhere in deep learning that we term kinetic asymmetry. And then what we have done is to generalize Netha theorem in these kind of scenario. Here is a standard Netha theorem. Their momentum and the generator of the symmetry, uh, its product is a uh, quantity. But then, of course, deep learning has ways dumping, have to converge somewhere. There is a term related to dumping. And then here is a kinetic asymmetry driven term. Again, kinetic energy breaks the symmetry of the loss landscape uh, in the modern deep learning setting. And then finally, these optimization methods that doesn't have to be Euclidean, it doesn't have to be Euclidean gradient. So there's a no, no Euclidean generalization. And then we can take modern deep network and then create all the broken conservation laws and then match the theory and uh, MPX almost like. Then I'm going to end by saying, you know, what, what was the practical application of it? The first insight was that, okay, so a couple of years ago, people said deep learning has become alchemy in the sense that people use many tools or many tricks in deep learning because they work, but then there is no scientific evidence of why it's working. But then we were able to demystify the central issue, which was that, okay, people use single batch normalization in deep learning. It's everywhere. Then people didn't know why it works. But then what we have mathematically proven using this net as learning dynamics was to say that, okay, normalization technique, which is a technique for architecture, is equivalent to modifying the optimization method for adaptive optimizer. Then for the efficiency of the deep learning models, we were also able to devise conserved flow-based pruning where we can remove a lot of parameters looking at the conserved quantity and then make the compressor size of the network by the order of magnitude, which is like 10 to the of like three, four, without degrading too many, much accurate. And here's the end of the this part of the talk. Thank you so much for. Uh, we're getting to the Q and A session, but we have time for a couple. DJ. Um, so I'm pretty surprised to say scales. Uh, here you say scale symmetry is true because physics occur all over the place in physics, mm. like critical points, mm. and uh, uh, you know the books written about it. So it may be a different scale symmetry. Yeah, yeah. So so th this is okay. So I I was like rushing, so skip that. But okay. So what people do in modern deep learning is that okay, you have activation of the layer, you apply you apply linear transformation by the matrix. Then every almost every time you do it, people subtract the mean of the activation and divide by the variance to normalize a signal so that the signal, the forward signal and back, backward signal doesn't exist. Then since you're dividing by the variance, multiplying the parameter vector uh, every, which is in my analogy, it's like a position vector of a system by constant, not gonna change the potential energy. But that's the kind of thing. So you're saying that this is a different kind of scale symmetry than the ones we usually see? Yeah, so, I, so we I didn't have any better way to call it, so we are calling it scale symmetry. But then yeah. it is in a different context from the standard physics scale. Okay. Yeah. So in, interpreting uh, the model parameters as like a physical particle is also what people do in Hamiltonian uh, Monte Carlo methods. Mm -hmm. Does your findings maybe help to speed up these methods or inform them in a smart way? Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. This particular work, and then also uh, there, there is this uh, line of literature trying to, let's say, because in conventional optimization world, people use discrete time to analyze all the discrete time update algorithms. So there, there are just like a list of, let's say, hundreds of optimization methods. 
then there has been an effort that I've been, I'm part of, which is to describe all the discrete algorithm using continuous time, then even go back to Lagrangian, and then view all the discrete algorithm, the generated family by this like a single Lagrangian. So the high level, like one of my research goal actually is to, instead of starting from this discrete optimization method, why don't we just look at the Lagrangian, study the property, and then discretize them to derive new kinds of optimization method, and hopefully uh, like we can contribute to CO dot, you know, your mission. Nice. Um, one more and then let's uh, go to break. Okay, regarding the first part, the concept combination, do your insights enable you now to give a prescription for improving the training speed? Yes, yes. So it's not too much about the training speed, but another thing that people care a lot about is predicting what happens if you increase the model size. Okay. Because even people at OpenAI never know until the training is done what's going to happen with the next generation of the model. Then well, actually one of the things that we are trying to do right now is to focus on the compositionality and then design some uh, benchmark thing. Okay, here's the concept one and here's the concept two. If you combine these concepts, you can do this. But if it becomes high dimensional and covering all the combinatorial space becomes like challenge, right? So then by benchmark, by taking compositional tasks, composing it into like elementary tasks, yeah. and then benchmarking using them wisely, we can basically predict, okay, so this part of composition is already learned. So this part also is uh, like highly likely, likely to be learned in the next generation. Okay, let's uh, thank you. <laughs> Gracias.